Can I have my slide, please? Okay, all right. So, so um, hi. Um, so, um, how many of you uh, actually have a um, a conventional laser? I hope that all of you have a conventional laser, right? Just get it, you know, lift it. So, yeah. And how many of you had a subluminal or stroke micropulse laser? Although that might not be allowed to use the word micropulse in this symposium, right? Okay. And how many of you have a two RT laser? Not yet. Okay. Right. So. So um, today, those are the three lasers I want to talk to you a little bit about. And I think the last speaker is already introducing you to some idea, some, some concept of the subluminal laser. And in the retinal sphere, it's slightly different. And similar with the SLT laser, it's also that it's a little bit of different to the retinal 2LT laser. So this is my disclosure. Some of you know that I have um, uh, made mostly left um, clinical practice, and then now be the head of um, Boringer Ingerheim. In um, so, so again, that if you haven't heard of the company Boringer Ingerheim, don't worry. You know, I would not be surprised that you never heard of us. And and although that we just sell about twenty billion dollars of drugs every year, and we spend about four and a half billion in research, and they give me a hundred million a year to play with in uh, retina. So I think that's why that I was with, with them. And um, it was here a little bit more about us in the next few years. So last three or four years that we're now opening free IND. So the three new drugs are now in human, and then all of them are currently um, in, in early phase development, and mostly in the US. And then obviously Quantel, um, I've done a lot of work with Quantel, and then have a consultancy agreement with them, and so on. So I've been talking about how laser work for DME for a long time. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. So historically, people say that you shoot the red dot. The red dot is the microaneurysm. But if you miss the red dot, it works. If you use a red laser, it works. And gradually, people realize that you cannot be directly shooting the red dot. In fact, shooting the red dot in the old days is very difficult using a Goldman lens. Nowadays, it's a lot easier. You know, but in fact, you can actually shoot the red dot with a yellow laser if you wanted to. But it's not that easy to do. So why does it all work? Right? And then gradually, that the idea is that, yeah, OK, you can do it lighter. Because you know, it seems to be, don't need to be that hitting is so hard. And Professor Pendano, a lot of you know him that from Italy, that is basically have introduced this idea that which a lot of us have been using it for many years, that just hit it gentler in the macula. If we're not doing a PRP, you don't need to destroy the retina. You just do a little bit gentler. And again, that works. Right? But you still see it. You still see that reaction, and you feel better. As a surgeon, you see something happening. It makes you feel better. Right? And, and then it works as well. So the idea is that, well, OK, you know, the light idea, we light the idea. You don't hit, need to hit the, the red dot. And you light the idea that when you go lighter, it kind of works. But you still see a reaction. So the question is, what about that we turn down the power even further so you don't see any reaction? Would that be a good idea? Well, that is something that we can talk about and think about it. And then the question arises, you know, um, the idea of this sublethal zone and that zone was over many years ago that Silver Silver Passat was my doctoral student, and now obviously full professor now. And then, um, you know, at the time that we were talking about, you know, if you kill some cell, that cell cannot actually help you, right? It's very fundamental. So the concept is that, well, if you do a laser, you've got a laser scar, you've got a bunch of dead cells there, how would that work? How does that reduce the edema? So we come up with this idea is that, yeah, you know, the reason is although you've got some dead cell in the middle and you've got some surrounding area that you'll be able to have sublethal. They don't die, but they can do something. And indeed, that we've been taught for multiple years that you need to keep gaps between the laser, right? Because if you do like a retinal tear, then you have no gap, right? Because you really don't want any gap. But in fact, that for macular disease, for it to work, you need to leave some gap. And indeed, that is actually the idea come up with that we need to do about that. So based on that idea, we need to go to reducing the power as much as possible, right? So we need to create less scar, let that tissue. And then it's not a new idea to a certain extent. You know, um, uh, people have been trying to turn the power down more and more. And one of the, uh, unfortunately, not very sure of a good in the, sc the screen there, it, uh, Daniel Rinsky in Stanford and I always argue, you know, on the argument, he said that, well, 
you know, I know, I know some of you know Daniel that um, he was one of the uh, patent holder for the Pascal laser, which is a major advance in PRP. And he always talk about that, you know, well, if you're using a Topcon, not now no longer Topcon, right? I can't even remember what the company is now. So, so you can turn the laser power down, and then by turn, and also reducing the duration, and then you can actually do the same thing as some of the so uh, a different laser that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So we can turn the power down, and then you can adjust it. And indeed, that in Rabbit, that you can actually show that if you turn the power down to around 20, 25%, and you actually have a activation of um, the cell, but without a lot of retinal damage, right? Then you work in animal, in work in rabbit, and so on. And, and again, you know, we've been arguing for a long time, and then I always said to him that, well, if you can convince your Stanford colleagues to do a control trial, and uh, using your technique, he's, he's obviously a PhD, and, and then I will try your technique. And, but so far, I yet to see a paper, not only from Stanford, from anyone, that who are actually using uh, the, the, the kind of turning your power down you know, as a concept for diabetic macular edema. So I'm still waiting. So that is what you talk about. They talk about this very fine tuning of power. And then that is what they were talking about, that, well, you know, conventional laser is not good, but reducing the power, reducing the duration, and so on. To cut a very long story short, is that is they all keep on telling me that I need to buy this really interesting software that, um, that you can calculate your power. And then I talk to one of the engineers and say, well, you know, I, I, you have duration, you have power, what, what other thing, what magic that your software actually does? So he quietly told me that, you know, well, you know, half the power, half the energy, half the duration, half the energy, and then you half the power, half the energy, then you become a quarter, 25%, which is what the rabbit is all about. But obviously being Stanford professor, that um, they published a paper with beautiful mathematics, which everyone say is fantastic. And I'm not sure how many people have PhD in mathematics, so, so you know, uh, arguably that when you look at it, it's just basically a curve showing that if you do that, you've got a very tight therapeutic window. In other words, is if you do too much energy, you damage the retina, too little energy, it doesn't work. So I think that is a fundamental what they say. Therefore, you're supposed to use this beautiful software that the machine can tell you by reducing the power to 25%. And I yet to see a randomized control trial on that. So I'm not going to spend, waste my time to investigate something that they can't even convince their own colleagues to do in the same institution. Now, we already talked about sub, uh, sub, uh, subliminal laser earlier. We talked about micropulse laser. Earlier, sorry, I missed up the email laser earlier. And, um, you know, you, you have this guy pulsing. And again, in sub-cycle, sub there is a 33% duty cycle, and we use a 5% duty cycle. And to be fair, our original publication are using a 15% duty cycle. And some people criticize us, oh, you keep on changing your parameter. Therefore, this doesn't, you're, you are not right, right. Well, to be fair, over the year, the way that we do conventional retinal laser have keep on changing the parameter. And when you're looking at DLCL net, which is one of the biggest you know, research group in doing laser, their protocol have come pretty different from the ETDRS study. And they never claimed that it was not working. So again, changing the protocol is because you're improving with the experience. Surgeons do that all the time. And you need to understand this is what we've been doing because we don't need 50%. I actually challenged the subcycle group before that why do you say 33% is the right place? 33% were chosen by the first guy who did it in Singapore um, in pigmented eye. So whether 25% might be a better option, today I'm not going to discuss that. I think they might be talking about it later, so you know, I don't want to argue on that. But we chose 5%. I have no idea whether 3% will work better. Right, but again, we find out between 5% and 15% are uh, virtually no different, except that 5% are safer. So safer, good, from my point of view, similar efficacy. So the concept of that is that is you pulsing the laser, you have a lot of discussion whether that you can turn the power down, you can, but then you are turning the power down to 5% of the power, and which is not even 25%. And when you're looking at that, is that is you can then deliver more energy to the RPE cell without um, destroying the retina. So the overall energy is much, much lower, but the, low, but the energy to the RPE cell are similar. That's the concept. 
And also that because now that we're creating all this area are uh, sublevel, we don't kill any cell, we don't even see any scar, any change whatsoever. And then the concept is then we don't need to leave gap. You remember, leaving gap is because that you want to have a sublevel zone because you're killing cell. So if you don't leave gap, you put them all together, and what happens is that when you put them all together, you need a lot more spot. So no fancy surprises that in the old day you might need to be able to do 100 spot, now they might need to do 400 spot, and then you say, well, 400 spot, not, not real macular laser. Right? Well, okay, you know, this is how it is. Right? So if you don't want to do less spot, then you want to damage the retina of the patient, go ahead and do it, you know, and, uh, until someone decided to sue you. Right? So go on to the pros and cons, and I think it was really simple to think about that, well, the the thing, reason for doing it is no scarring, it's safe to do. Um, it, I haven't talked time to talk about sensitivity and reading speed. We did some work on that in the past. And obviously it's a new machine, but nowadays there are more and more machines, including the almost standard equivalent to the open scar laser, the multi-spot laser, will have, uh, will have the multiple, multi, uh, multi micro pulse module. And so if your new multi-spot laser do not have one, I think you probably should choose one that with that option. And like what we discussed earlier, if you still want to do ART, you know, you're allowed to, but then care whether you can do something slightly different. So this is my parameter, and I don't want you to copy it down or photograph it. Uh, Quantel should be more than happy to send you a copy. But please do not use this parameter on someone else's machine. And someone actually told me that they were using Aradec machine and they were using my parameter and they say, you see scarring. You know, so I put that warning out there now is well, obviously that I was a Eurotex consultant for many, many years. And then, you know, but I don't know what the machine is different now. So, so, so don't use a different parameter. You need to ask Eurotex for that parameter. So we have shown that before, that using Pascal subspecial laser mode, you still see changes. You don't see the visibly in the, in the front of the photograph or clinical exam, which is better, but you still see an OCT. And that was independently done in, in, um, in Japan, and that was subsequently done in, uh, even actually come back from Stanford themselves. And then, oops, sorry. And then, you know, the way that I see it is very simple, right? Endpoint management, is they probably don't have enough energy, but you might be at a very, win very tight window and you can have a little bit of, and you can still leave the scarring. And to be fair, you really want to, it's still probably better than conventional laser. However, that what I would worry about is that you either scar the retina or you don't deliver enough energy. With the subfacial subluminal laser, it's different. The target is different. And we don't see any scar. Like what we discussed earlier in the last talk, you can then repeat it, you can do something more and something different from it. And also they don't just trust one author, you know, and I think that I was, I was told that there was almost like 400 publications of micro pulse laser uh, by now. And then it's just not my group, you know, the group that in, in Italy, the group in Brazil, the group in, 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 Germ in Germany, in US, and, and a lot of people have now uh, come up with the same conclusion that either that we are just all liar or actually work. Now, to be fair, scientifically, whether that this so-called heat releasing window is true or not, I'm still not 100% sure because I think that it might be not totally possible. And in fact, that Daniel showed me some data that they, they claim that what I'm trying to prove or talk about is wrong. Although I'm not saying he is right, but I just say that I can't prove to him that I'm right, right? So clinically work, scientifically, exactly how you work, I'm not 100% sure. And to be fair, I'm still not quite sure why performance, you know, could able to not only reducing your glucose uh, level, but you can actually reducing your, uh, reducing your cancer rate and also reducing your uh, aging. And I'm taking performance just for fun, you know, because I think the, little, the multiple studies show that, you know, reducing cancer and reducing um, uh, are, are good. And we have no idea why. You know, so no idea why, but multiple big study convinced me to take metformin. To be fair, that there's also a study showing that metformin can reduce your risk um, of being diabetic, and also that, or you can do exercise. So this is the choice of exercise or metformin, and metformin seems to be the way to go. <laughs> now, that is now come to the 2RT laser. The 2RT laser got a lot of press recently for those who know about it. And it's not, the, it's not true at, like the SLT laser, but the mechanism to a certain extent might be similar. And they got a light 
at the very, very short duration, and then they create uh, a, uh, it is a free nanosecond duration, and it's supposedly target the melanosome, and supposedly cause less collateral damage. And that's what the claim is. And they also said, give a caution warning, is don't go and use a SLT laser, and then put a lens in, and then use a SLT laser to shoot at the retina, because it's different, right? So I'm, I'm not sure how it's different, but again, they told us it's different, because the 2RT laser is apparently extremely expensive, and they are so special. And such. So, again, so I look at their literature on that. I was curious because of C. John Marshall and I, again, you know, David, Daniel, and I always argue about top con endpoint management and subliminal laser. And John Marshall and I always argue about uh, a two hour tier laser. Especially, John was my doctorate supervisor, you know, so, so I kind of do give him some respect, but obviously I can tell him that, you know, that he's wrong every so often as well. So, this is their publication to say that the cartoon would say that one beam out, and then you had multiple hit, and then you only hit the star, right? And that is actually what they are claiming. But look at the publication, you've got a hole in the middle. But where is these little stars coming from, right? So again, you can see in the second picture, you know, yes, but they do recover. They do slide over and recover. And to be fair, because of short duration, you don't have enough heat, you don't hit the retina. So you preserve the retina, which is, which is absolutely meet the requirement for what they say. But this daughter thing, I yet to see it. And then when they were looking at doing uh, the juicent removal, and as you know, that, excuse me, that was uh, initially done that, uh, uh, in, uh, in Melbourne and then become a multi-center trial, which again, is an interesting study. And they, get the, the laser spot quite far out, um, away from the center. And again, go and take a look at that, that photograph. And again, they were calling that there was no scarring. And I said, well, you know, it's clearly the uh, RPE change color. Oh, there's RPE remodeling, okay? If you want to call the RPE remodeling, let's call the RPE remodeling. But remodeling in a way that I can see there is something wrong, right? So anyway. That is, uh, you can look at the paper because it was, it was published. And then they do retrosensitivity uh, retro laws over the area. And again, to be fair, they did not do the damage to the retina, so therefore they don't have microperimetry laws, which is way better than conventional laser. But in subliminal laser that we have published before, not only that we don't uh, have sensitivity laws, we have sensitivity gain if we are improving. But you can have a look at the data and you can actually see the scar. Uh, uh, not SCAR, RPE cell remodeling. So when you're comparing the different type of laser, I'm going to just leave you a, a, some similar idea over there. Um, so certainly for diabetic disease, uh, those are quite clear. For juice and removal, that, um, you know, they certainly have two RT laser, have, uh, have a case series by Robin Hamilton uh, showing that there is some effect, but then there's only one paper, is a case, is a case series, they have no control. And again, we're still waiting for a control trial for that. It might work, you know, I don't know. Um, but it's certainly the big stop is to go for juice and removal. So, in summary, that um, I, I have hoped that to be able to show you that subliminal laser had multiple publication, multiple group around the world, multiple control trial to show you that it worked and it doesn't have any visible damage in OCT and, and fluorescein angiogram. We don't know whether you have damage if you use adaptive optics. I have not seen anyone publish with that so far. It might be. It might be kill a few photoreceptor. I'm not sure. And, but you improve retinal sensitivity in DME study. And for management, I think the concern is that whether you have enough energy and whether you overdo it a bit, and whether that the, in certain independent study that they still see some degree of uh, scarring. In the 2RT laser, that it doesn't seem to be have uh, a major efficacy other than juice and removal. And again, today I don't have enough time to talk about uh, juice and removal. And if you believe that 2RT laser can remove juice adequately, and then, you know, and, and then, but none of you have bought one yet, so go and read the paper. And I think that is a good reason why then none of you have bought one yet, and also that why that um, you know you probably don't need, need to go out and buy one um, you know quickly. You know, but again, um, you know, it will be a separate talk altogether. Thank you very much for your attention.